Good morning, brothers and sisters. I hope we all slept well. I had a little trouble sleeping, but praise God for his mercy and goodness. I do believe that he has the power to and will strengthen me. So this message this morning is more geared toward our youth. You know, ever since I came into the Advent faith and ever since I came into ministry, I've had burden for the youth. Um, I am 37 years young, and I know what it's like to be in the position of a youth trying to gain your footing as a Christian in this world. So the title of this message is The Struggle is Real. And the reason I titled it that way is because a lot of the times what I hear from the youth is the struggles that they go through and how the older generation just doesn't understand. And I just, I just challenge that for the simple fact that I know what it's like to be a youth. I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to try to gain the mastery over sin. So we're going to begin in the book of John, chapter 16. And I want to read verse 32 and 33 because there's comfort, there's hope. Um, the struggle, the battle that we go through, all for a reason, all for a purpose. There's this overarching uh, claim or prize that there is for us to grab. And once we keep our eyes fixed on the prize, the troubles seem to be minute. So in John chapter 16, verse 32 and 33, it says, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. How many of us know the number one thing that is killing youth today? It's depression. It's stress, depression, the need to fit in or perform for the world in some way. In the Desire of Ages, page 121 or 122, this is what it says. It says, by passing over the ground which man must travel, our Lord has prepared the way for us to overcome. It is not his will that we should be placed at a disadvantage in the conflict with Satan. He would not have us intimidated and discouraged by the assaults of the serpent. You know, in speaking with a lot of the youth that are Christians, it seems like even with Christ, they feel it hard to cope. Right. And I think it's because the the faith and the works seem to get confusing. Right. Because <clears throat> the great idea of faith and works is that faith produces works, not works producing faith. Right. A lot of the the messages that I hear from uh, people these days is that all you need to do is keep the law and you're good as if the law can save us, right? It is faith by faith. We are saved, right? And when we have faith that Christ can and will do what he says he will then the law is followed.
In BTS, May 1st, 1915, paragraph 3, look at what it says here. It says, when sin struggles for the mastery in the human heart, when guilt seems to oppress the soul and burden the conscience, when unbelief clouds the mind, who lets in the beams of light? Whose grace is sufficient to subdue sin? And who gives the precious forgiveness and parts all our sins, expelling the darkness and making us hopeful and joyful in God? Jesus, the sin-pardoning Savior. He is still our advocate in the courts of heaven. And those whose lives are hid with Christ in God must arise and shine because the glory of the Lord has risen upon them. Once we understand what faith in Christ is and are able to grab hold of him with unwavering faith, then we can experience joy. Now, let me ask you this. Is joy the same as happiness? No. Right? I can be joyful and still be unhappy. I can praise God in the midst of a storm, can I? Absolutely. The reason of the spiritual feebleness of today is the low estimate of the believer Sorry, let me start that again. The reason of the spiritual feebleness of today is the low estimate the believer is constantly inclined to form of his spiritual character. But he is of the value that the Lord Jesus has paid an infinite price for his salvation. You know, I've had several conversations with many youth regarding depression and eventually it leads to them breaking down and saying it's so bad that I want to take my life can you imagine but here's the thing one of the things I try to remind them of is how valuable they are. The life that was paid as a ransom for them. I constantly try to communicate the fact that I've been there. I know what you're going through. I know that the struggle is real, but hang on. Because believe me when I tell you, I was at the same point. I was at a point where I wanted to take my life. And I picked up the word of God and I begin to read the promises of God. And I heard the spirit of God say to me, now think about this. How selfish would it be for you to take your life when a life was paid to buy it? And it shook me. It really did. I got on my knees and I prayed and I said, Lord, please forgive me. For I really thought about doing that selfish act. Let us embrace the opportunities and privileges which will increase our value with God by using all the treasures of his grace to become precious and lovely in his sight. If this were done, many more souls of solid moral worth would be seen. Because by uniting with Jesus, our lives become imbued with his spiritual likeness. 
practical holiness would run like threads of gold through our lives. And as they beheld the wholesome character of God, heavenly angels would say, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than a golden wedge of Ophir. We're precious in the sight of God. We can't even imagine how precious we are. Think about this. One time I was having a conversation with a young lady. She had had this huge, huge argument with her stepfather. And she wanted to run away. Never to come back again. And she looked at me and said, I don't think you realize what I'm going through, what I have to go through. And this was an Adventist young lady. And I mourned with her for a little bit. And I said, I know exactly what you're going through. I said, except... I took it a little bit further. I did run away. I said, listen here. Think about this. With Christ, how many things are possible? All things. All things. I said, so it's possible for you to overcome this situation here, isn't it? Yes, I think so. But this is, and this, and this needs to happen, and this, and this. No, no. Stop worrying about the outside factors, right? Grab hold of Christ and say, you take me, right? Say to him, be honest with him. I can't pick myself up right now. I can't take that step that I so want to. Because he has been made our comforter. He's been made to pick us up. Right? That, that famous painting, Footprints in the Sand. We know at the time that we cannot walk, God will carry us. He's able to. We just have to believe it. I begin to tell her that, look, when you become older, your problems don't get any easier. Right? Most of the youth think, hey, look, when you're an adult, I can't tell you how many kids said, hey, look, I just wish I could grow up. Right? I can't wait to be an adult. And me, I'm here like, man, I, can't, I wish I was a kid again. Right? In, in some way, they seem, they think to, to themselves that it's going to be easier. No. The problems get a little bit harder. Listen to this. The Lord spent how long trying to get the children of Israel out of Egypt? How long was it? Now, how long did he spend trying to get Egypt out of the children of Israel? Right? So understand, there is a battle that we are facing. Right? And that battle needs divine assistance. We can't, we can't do it on our own. Right? In Matthew, chapter 4 and verse 4, what does it tell us? Man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If there's anything in this world that the youth should be feasting on, it's the word of God. Right? However, we know that there's temptations, right? There's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's, uh, what is it, TikTok. There's everything that this world wants you to feast on. But we should be feasting upon the word of God. Because that's where true salvation is. That's where we see our true value. That's where depression ceases and joy begins. Right? In our struggles, in our walk with Christ, in our war against sin, the Lord is going to have to do things in us that we may not like. Is that correct? There's this process called pruning. There was a time in my relationship with God where I went to church and I was speaking to an elder. I was speaking to this elder, and this elder was, oh, man, he was just overwhelming me with all of the things that he said I needed to do. You know, I went to him for help, and it was like he pulled out this scroll and was like, well, if you want help, first you need to do this and this and this and this. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. How? How? How can I do all of that? Well, brother, that's what you're going to have to figure out. It wasn't much help to me. But here's the thing. Here's where I learned from. I learned from this situation in the book of Numbers. In the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 5 to 9. What do we see here? What situation is happening here? God was providing a way for the people to be nourished, right? And the people were complaining against the means that he used to provide, right? In the book of Numbers uh, 21, verse 5, it says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Right? This was kind of my outlook on what God had done to me. Right? You brought me out of the world so that I could perish in the wilderness. How in the world am I supposed to be sustained here? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. Right? It can't be as easy as picking up the word of God and letting the word of God prune me. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take the serpents away from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it, shall do what? Shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. 
think about this. I was complaining. Complaining. Here's the two things that I knew. I knew that in the world, the world had did, done nothing but use and abuse me. But when I came to Christ, I had this feeling of being left alone. So I started murmuring because there was a pruning process that needed to happen. And I didn't like that process. But you know what happened to me? The Lord gave me a fiery serpent experience. He said, okay, go. Go back to the world. And let me tell you, when I went back to the world, it was harder to come back to Christ. It was so much harder to come back to Christ. But when I did, I had to resolve one thing. Now that I'm here, I must look upon him in faith. I can't draw back. Because if I go back, I'm like a dog returning to its vomit. But I had to believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that do diligently seek him. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 428, it says, As the Israelites indulged in the spirit of discontent, they were exposed to find fault even with their blessings. Lord, have mercy. And the people spake, spake against God and against Moses. Where have, wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Moses faithfully set before the people their great sin. It was God's power alone that had preserved them. It's simple. Read the word of God. Believe it is truth in your life. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 430, this is what it says. The people well knew that there was no power in the serpent of brass to cause such a chain, change in those who looked upon it. The healing virtue was from God alone. In his wisdom, he chose this way of displaying his power. By this simple means, the people were made to realize that this affliction had been brought upon them by their sins. They were also assured that while obeying God, they had no reason to fear, for he would preserve them. There's safety in obedience, right? Once we place ourselves on the side of Christ, the war, the battle against sin becomes easier. However, if we don't have divine help, we're only left with humanity, which will easily succumb to sin. So at every point, we need to be praying we need to be petitioning the throne of God. Saying, give me what I can't give myself. There's no shame in asking for help, especially when that help comes from God. There was one thing that I had to realize in growing up from youth to what you youth would call old folk now. One thing, it is impossible, impossible 
to make it without Christ. <clears throat> to keep our eyes single on Christ in the midst excuse me, of our trials might be the hardest, most valuable lesson we will ever learn. Many of us who could be strong ambassadors for Christ get discouraged in our walk because we find ourselves caught in the storm of life. I asked the youth one day in our class, do you guys ever have disagreement with your parents? Right? Do you guys get irritated or upset with your parents? Almost all of them said no. They were like, no, that doesn't happen in Africa. <laughs> right? If mom and dad do. And I was shocked. I was like, man, okay. Yeah, I wish I had that wisdom. In the book, Help in Daily Living, paragraph eight, or page eight, paragraph one, this is what the author says. And think about this. When you become a Christian, there is a battle waiting for you. There is a serious battle waiting for you, right? Because once you were in the pocket of the enemy, and now you're outside fighting against him. So what should you expect? But believe me when I tell you that all of this battling, all of this struggle, all of the trials, they're worth it. They're worth every bit of it. It says many who sincerely consecrate their lives to God, God's service, are surprised and disappointed to find themselves as never before confronted by obstacle and beset by trials and perplexities. They pray for Christ's likeness of character for fitness for the Lord's work, and they are placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all the evil of their nature. Faults are revealed of which they did not even suspect the existence. Like Israel of old, they question, if God is leading us, why do all of these things come upon us? Notice what it says. In page 9, paragraph 1. It is because God is leading them that these things come upon them. Trials and obstacles are the Lord's chosen method of what? Discipline. Discipline. And his appointed condition of success. He who reads the hearts of men knows their characters better than they themselves know them. He sees that some have powers and susceptibilities which rightly directed might be used in the advancement of his work. In his providence, he brings these persons into different positions and varied circumstances that they might discover in their character the defects which have been concealed from their own knowledge. Right? The pruning process. He gives them opportunity to correct these defects and to fit themselves for his service. He often permits of the fires of affliction to assail them that they might be what? Purified. This is a work that God is doing in his people. And we can't prevent it. To prevent this work would be the loss of our salvation. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is completely and utterly rejecting every effort that God puts forth to remedy the character. Right? 
Paragraph two on page nine says, the fact that we are called upon to endure trials shows that the Lord Jesus sees in us something precious, which he desires to develop. If he saw in us nothing whereby he might glorify his name, he would not spend time in refining us. He does not cast worthless stones into his furnace. It is valuable ore that he refines. The blacksmith puts the iron and steel into the fire that he might know what manner of metal they are. The Lord allows his chosen ones to be placed in the furnace of affliction to prove what temper they are of and whether they can be fashioned for his work. So believe me when I tell you this. During these times, I may not be happy, but I could definitely be joyful. I can definitely find reason to praise God because he sees in me something that he can use. If I was worthless, I wouldn't go through the trials that I go through. If he saw that he couldn't use me, he wouldn't spend time refining me. So joy, have joy in those trials. So let me close by saying this. There was a time that my son's mother asked me, said, hey, um, your son's praying for all kind of craziness. Can you show him how, or can you tell him how prayer works? And the request was kind of odd to me, right? Can I, I tell him how prayer works? Say, yeah, tell him how prayer works. I said, okay, let me open up my Bible. So I opened up the Bible where it says, ask and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Right? She says, don't you think that's a little bit broad and drastic? I said, no. I believe we have a powerful God. And I believe that if our hearts are in line with him, we can ask of him anything and he'll give it to us. Right? I said, so I can't so much tell him how to pray. I can maybe teach him what to pray for. I can direct him in the path. However, if you think that what he's praying for is impossible, and I can't divulge the thing that he was praying for, but if you think that it's impossible, maybe read your Bible. God is waiting to give us those promises. He truly is. He's waiting for us to come outside of self and behold the brazen serpent. He's waiting for us to realize that the trials and tribulations that we go through are a refinery. He's waiting for us to acknowledge that the manna is good enough.
I forgot the reference on this one, but I'm going to read it and I'll get you the reference a little bit later. It says, the potter takes the clay and molds it according to his will. He kneads it and works it. He tears it apart and presses it together. He wets it and then dries it. He lets it lie for a while without touching it. When it is perfectly pliable, he continues the work of making it a vessel. He forms it into shape and on the wheel trims and polishes it. He dries it in the sun and bakes it in the oven. Thus, it becomes a vessel fit for use. So the great master worker desires to fashion and mold us. And as the clay is in the hands of the potter, so are we to be in the hands, in his hands. We are not to try to do the work of the potter. Our part is to yield ourselves to be molded by the master work. That is my desire. My desire and the desire of you all should be to submit to God and let him mold, shape, change you to whatever vessel he would have you to be and be satisfied whether you're a cup or a bowl. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, Lord, we are thankful that we can come to you in prayer, asking you for the things that we lack, asking you for your wisdom, your life, your glory. Father, it's our desire to take that which you give us and give it to the world. But as I said before, we need to get out of self. We need to behold Christ greater with a more deeper interest than we do now. Father, please help us to be joyful even in the times when it seems unpleasant to do so. Let us continue to bring glory and honor to your name in all things. Father, thank you for the things that you have done in our life and that you will do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.